my number one thing that I wish people didn't do, and if you're listening, don't do this. It's <laughs> finding emails manually, you know, like one at a time or just figuring out where the contact information is on a website as opposed to doing it in bulk, like with a spreadsheet. Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy, founder of QuickMail.io. Hey, and this is Jack from emailsthatsell.com. Where did my day go? Spending too much time on cold email without the results you want? It doesn't have to be like that. In fact, it's a sign that too much time is being spent on the things that don't matter. And so like an entrepreneur spending time on his business logo instead of acquiring new clients, cold email also has low value activity that makes no sense to spend a lot of time on. So if you find yourself cursing about all the time spent at doing cold email, you may want to pause a second and listen to what Jack and I have to say about this. And since we're nice people, we also let you know where we would spend the time instead so you can get the results you want. Enjoy. Today, we're going to talk about wasting time sending cold emails. Yeah, and things where you should spend your time, right? That's exactly right. So... Jeremy's got his list, I've got my list, and one by one, we're going to reveal our top cold email time wasters, and then, like Jeremy said, finish out the episode with three of our biggest areas where you should be spending more time. Yeah, we kind of felt like it's fine talking about you shouldn't waste your time in doing X and Y, but it's kind of cool to tell you instead, spend that time on doing A and B. There you go. Yeah, so... Less of the bad stuff, more of the good stuff. Jeremy, I want to know what's number one on your list for top cold email time wasters. <laughs> Damn it. I was about to say, Jack, kick things out. Uh, but um, here we go. Actually, now I get more chances of not picking up one of your things. So I'm fine with going first. Okay. Here's my top number one. Top number one is the title. And for me, people spend way too much time. You mean subject line? Subject line, sorry. Yeah, I call it title in Kurt, so that's why I use title. My bad. Subject line. So people spend way too much time on the subject line, ignoring the actual preview. There's no real email reader now that only display the subject line and you have to click on it in order to, you know, shield the email. You always come up with a sort of preview, whether you're on Gmail, whether you're on your iPhone. There's always some sort of preview. And people spend way too much time trying to find a fancy title where most people actually just skip the title to just look at the preview. And really, you don't want to waste it with like, hello, my name is X. Because usually, you kind of see it already with, you know, whoever is sending you that, that stuff. So I don't really want to open it, that sort of thing. So spend less time on a title, find something that, you know, fulfill a contract. If you want something from them, just mention it up front in a title. Yeah. And then just spend more effort into, you know, your intro line, your first line that will be displayed as the preview. I love that. Jack, what's your number one? All right. My number one thing that I wish people didn't do, and if you're listening, don't do this. It's <laughs> finding emails manually, you know, like one at a time or just figuring out where the contact information is on a website as opposed to doing it in bulk, like with a spreadsheet. I still talk to people, not every day, but probably every week who have a process of finding emails that involves them having a tab of hunter.io opened up and then a <laughs> website of their prospect and they're doing some reading and copy paste and then grabbing that. It's just takes way too long. You totally should not be spending your time a, because there's a much faster way to do it, like I said, using a, a bulk upload of a spreadsheet of names and domains. And that's a very low ticket item. Spend your time on other things like what Jeremy and I are going to finish the episode on instead of this sort of manual finding emails. But Jack, I do like, it's like grocery shopping. I do like to shop around. Am I going to talk to this person? Yes, no. Uh -huh. oh, this one? Oh, yes, uh -huh. let me find the email address. Okay, and, well then you know. enjoy uh, slowly putting <laughs> cold emails out there, but uh, don't drag me in on that process because I'll puke. The funny thing for is that this is an immense time waster, actually. Or people will spend like, you know, three hours. They find like two, three, maybe five people. And then they think like, whew, I've done my cold email. That's so hard to do cold email. Yeah. Or even worse, 
I'll talk to people who say, yeah, Jack, we have like a big team of VAs that all they do is they find email addresses and, you know, they're fast. They could find like four to five an hour and they're like, <laughs> and as soon as I hear that, I uh, I put my headphones down and I you must cringe. Yeah, I just, I send a prayer out to that person and try and guide them to the land of uh, bulk email finding. All right, fine. So please don't do that. Jeremy, what's number two on your list? Number two on my list usually doesn't happen with more seasonal cool emailers. It's more like people starting up. People starting up usually spend way too much time thinking about what font style should I use? What color? What size? You know, at the end of the day, this is not a beauty contest. And then people just spend like way too much time on how it should look like instead of focusing on, on the value proposition and what's really important in the email. So hopefully if you're a listener, you're not falling prey of this, but I've seen that enough times. So I bring it up in our top three time waster. Yep. Hey, fair enough. That is a huge time waster. And we haven't even talked about HTML formatting or, or like <laughs> designing a cold email. That's more a thing in the past, but totally agree. To me, if it's readable, and in fact, a default font is probably the best thing you can go with because you don't want to get fancy there. It should be legible and that's it. Okay. That's right. Verdana, by the way, is my favorite web font, FYI. Okay. Number two. My second cold email time waster, this is trying to add personalization for your offline prospects. For people who just don't have an, a presence online whatsoever, it can be a great idea to add personalization, but if you're looking at an IT director for a mid-sized company who didn't bother filling out their LinkedIn profile at all, has no Twitter page, has nothing online, a, a missing headshot, it's a waste of time. You'll be looking on Google, on LinkedIn for so many things, and you'll end up with something really clunky like, go Hawks. I hope you had a, a good college experience <laughs> back in 98. And um, it'll look rad. It'll look bad. So FYI, for those kind of prospects, grab something from their company that's going to fit nicely in the email. Don't waste your time trying to invent something that is just not on the internet. It hurts. I'm guilty of this one. So, you know... <laughs> Straight to the heart. Um, high five on uh, moving on to the next one. Definitely here. Okay. Um, my turn, right? Yeah, your turn. Hit us. All right. So my last top three time waster, and I put this one in my top three just because people ask me so many times about this question where, in fact, I don't think people should spend nearly as much time on this question. And the question is basically, how many times should I follow up? And the idea behind that is to try to well-craft your entire campaign before testing it. Because, you know, with automation nowadays, you can set your first email, wait three days, and then you basically have three days to figure out where your follow-up should be. Right. It's not like if you have to build your 10 different steps emails ahead of time, thinking about all the possible combinations without even receiving the first reply. So I would say, you know, instead... Try to build your first email, get the first emails out of the door, you know, and then you got three days to do the follow-up. Do one, two, three follow-ups until you realize, actually, I'm not getting replies anymore. Or this is, you know, I'm trying to beat, you know, a dead horse and this campaign actually doesn't work. Yeah. And that way you probably have done like three follow-ups and then you can move on to something else, instead of trying to do the 12 different follow-ups because Jack and I been telling you to keep on following up. There you go. You know, I have to give Quick Mail some props because not every cold email tool lets you do that, actually. Oh, yeah, that's true. I've seen tools where you launch a campaign and it's frozen in time. It's like, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I hate to bash people too much, but it's like the Atari joystick version of video games when <laughs> today it's like virtual reality. It's just not everybody's up on it. So kudos for making that easy. Uh, you're too kind, Jack. Thank you. Appreciate it. There you go. Um, <laughs> all right. My last one. Don't catch yourself wasting time on this. But this is a weird one for me because, yes, it is a big time waster. However, it cannot be ignored or else you'll fail every time at cold mm. email. So what the hell am I talking about? List prepping. List prepping. You need it. You need to make sure that the company name doesn't have the comma LLC, Inc., whatever. You need to make sure that the first name is not doctor because you're 
the way you built your list pulled that in when it should have been something else. Hi, doctor. Yeah, making sure that your merge tags are line, like that has to happen. But man, does it take a lot of time. And also along this list prepping task is uploading that list into said cold email tool and matching the merge tags. And it's just kind of a tedious process that if you let it, it'll eat up two to three to four hours of your week, depending how many prospects you've got. But the good news is there's some cool software slash virtual assistants who are happy to help you out with that. So you can fix your attention on bigger things. And so that's why it's a weird one. You know, it's list prepping, got to do it, but don't do it, if that makes sense. Got to do it, but don't do it yourself. Okay, got it. Makes sense. We've got it. Now it's time for the good stuff. What the heck should I be doing more of, Jeremy? All right. So first thing I would say is to research and spend a lot of time researching what's in it for them. So did they earn the right to come on your list? And if they do, you better provide a lot of value to them. So make sure your product or services will be a home run. Mm. Like, oh, you're not agreeing with that, Jack? <laughs> no, no, no. I was saying, hmm. Okay, so let me get this straight. You're saying make sure your product or service will be a home run to the person that you're reaching out to. Yeah? Yeah. Like, don't try to reach out to, you know, every company that has more than 50 employees in the tech industry. Okay. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So instead, you know, spend a lot of time figuring out what are the attributes that will be important for you to have so more value out of your product. I see what you're saying. Okay. So this is interesting. I had a conversation last week with somebody who said, Jack, we have like seven different products and some companies are a better fit for others. Who should we be reaching out to and what product should we put there first? And it kind of went back to what you were saying was like, okay, let's use the fact that you've been in business for years and really take what you know about your product and who's resonating with it most and start there. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, kind of. I know it's kind of extreme, but if you have, for example, a hosting system or something that is processed in the cloud, just make sure you don't contact companies that are mostly working offline, you know? It's kind of a given, an obvious one, but mm. it's important to have a good match between your value and who you're contacting. If there is, instead of, you know, it's a sort of shotgun approach, spray and pray kind of thing, you want to spend more time to narrow down your list of people, but make sure that everyone on your list will have a higher chance of resonating with your offer. Does that actually make sense? Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. And, uh, Stole my thunder. My number one thing to spend more time on this year, 2020, is building a smaller, hotter list. And that's pretty much what you were describing. So yeah, allow me to skip to my number three because it's an interesting <laughs> spin on the last three minutes of this cast here. Okay. And that is spend more time A-B testing your value prop. So I'm not really talking about the product market fit here anymore. Instead, I'm saying, all right, if you have this hosting service, good for you, but how are you going to put that in a cold email that makes your prospects day? That's the value prop. That's, hey, maybe I can give you a site audit to see where your page that's most likely to crash is, or I can test your server load in five minutes, just send me the best way to contact you, or Perhaps it's, hey, here's a video tip based on the kind of traffic that you're getting according to Alexa. You probably want to make sure these two things are set up. Can I send it your way? You know, there's many ways to enter the conversation and to give to your prospects. And that's exactly what I'm talking about, trying out, testing different value props. So funny because it resonates with my number three, oh, wow. which is kind of a similar line. Maybe the number two will be a differentiator here. But my number three is actually continuous improvement. Way too often, people got the idea or the mentality of fire and forget kind of thing. But in essence, you do need to continuously check every week how your campaign is doing so you can react better, whether there is an open rate problem, you know, deliverability issue, or whether you need to find something that resonates better with your target audience. So continuous improvement, spend time on this. Do dedicate some time each week to review your campaign and then try to improve it. 
I love it. Now I'm terrified to see if we have the exact same two, <laughs> which would mean our one, two, and three in that order were exactly the same. That's right. And uh, listeners, we're not comparing notes before the call. It helps us keep the conversation <laughs> less robotic. And we have a wonderful editor who makes us sound much smarter and quicker than uh, real time. But That's right. shall we say number two? Should yeah. we just go at the same time? What's your number two? No. <laughs> okay, at the same also time. My number two is in three letters, so maybe it's the same as yours. Okay, good. Probably not. No. Uh, my number two Oof. that you spend more time on is deliverability. Oh, no, it's not. It's okay. Not. Oof. We're not identical clones. You save the day. All right, well, then let me carry on with deliverability. What does that look like to spend more time on deliverability? By now, you know it matters. If prospects don't get your email to the inbox, then you got no hope of turning them into a lead. So deliverability matters. How do you spend more time on it? Check, look at your open and reply rates because opens aren't the full story in my opinion. They can be slightly deceiving. Some people turn off open tracking, et cetera. And if you notice a decline, red alert should go off campaign wide. Try different testing tools. Jeremy, I think QuickMail has a baked in tool. Yep. Use that. Really, you want to catch deliverability problems early. That's what I'm talking about. So four weeks don't go by and you said, huh, that wasn't the strongest <laughs> month. What do you think happened here? So I recommend twice a week, definitely once. Just see what happened, not over the entire campaign, but at a week by week basis. Uh, sometimes Jeremy and I have recommended just pausing campaigns every week and starting them back up, even if everything's the same, so that you have an apples to apples week by week. How's my deliverability going? Yep. Comparison there. So cool stuff. The last part of deliverability, just be prepared for that rainy day. If you ever do come across problems, have a domain on deck, aging nicely, just sitting there for you. So if you do say, oh crap, you can pull that fresh domain and try, try again. Very nice one. Now, the interesting thing is I did think about deliverability. I'm sure. And I didn't include it for. And the reason why I didn't include it is because true or false, I believe that if you actually have the right audience and you have the right product and that resonates a lot with people, people will just engage more with you and therefore deliverability will not be a problem. That said... In a perfect world. Yeah, well, I think it's close to that being the truth. but. Anyway, here's my number two. My number two is CTA because a lot of people have very weak CTAs and they have like a good product. They have the right audience, but somehow it's unclear what the next step is and they basically lose them at the CTA level. Let me know when you got some time. And it's just like, well, I will never let you know. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. When was the last time I had time? Honestly, you know, I was a recipient. So I don't think that works as well. And I think it's very important to spend some time into figuring out what do I really want the next step to be? Yeah. Do I want them to reply? Tell them. Do I want them to click on a link? Do it. So make your CTA crystal clear. There is no confusion and it's an easy step for them to perform once they're at this stage. But Jeremy, isn't it really nice to put, would love to hear your thoughts on this, Thanks in advance. Isn't that like friendly? Doesn't the prospect appreciate that tone? Sure, I do appreciate, but you know, it slips in my inbox because I don't really know how to reply to that, honestly. Yeah. It's just like, what's the next step? If you can spell it out, it's something like just hit reply and you know, we'll figure out the details together yeah. or yeah. something that is more direct into what they need to be doing yeah. is a winner. Spot on and if you still don't believe us that you need to be like plain English, crystal clear, direct, tell your prospect what to do, just pick up a magazine and flip through some of the ads. And if you find one without a call to action that tells you to do something, I want you to, I don't know, frame it or burn it because it just, it doesn't happen. People don't operate like that. If you're vying for somebody's attention and you're indirect, you're unclear, your message will just, blend in with all the junk, with the sea of information that we keep swimming through every day. And so to cut through the noise, even though it sounds counterintuitive because you're dealing with smart people, let's say, you got to spell it out for them. Can't say it clearly enough, right? Direct call to action. We have a link 
to the CTA swipe file. Do you want to tell us? I forget what it is. Yeah. Quickmail.io slash goodies. There you go. Check it out. Download it. There's like uh, a couple hundred clear direct calls to action. You can copy paste and test things out. Quick question for you, Jack. It's kind of sidetracked, but given that we gave our top three, I think we can go for it. Do you think people are shy in their CTA because of the ego or because of laziness or just because they're fearful? I think they're afraid of sounding bossy, aggressive, mm. harsh. At the end of the day, we're really asking our prospects to engage with us and our parents always told us to be nice. And it doesn't seem nice to necessarily tell people what to do. It seems bossy, you know? That's what we're fighting against as writers who want to be clear and communicate well. Interesting. I was thinking there could be some people who are just afraid of being rejected. And of course, if you go to wishy-washy things, then people will not answer to you. Yeah, you're only right. Only they really want it, you know? And then they're driving the things. I don't know. Yeah, there's... Probably many hidden psychological <laughs> reasons behind all of us, but I promise you, we've got a lot to learn still, even to this day, from our direct response copywriters who are, in a lot of ways, the godfather of everything we're doing here. And that's stopping someone, interrupting someone, so to speak, and convincing them in a few lines to take action. Yeah, we're not asking for payment details like they were and still are today, but nonetheless, we're asking them to do something to take them out of their groove and put them on a new track, so to speak. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, I recommend Joe Sugarman. He's got a couple of books that you could do worse by starting out your direct response copywriting adventure with. And uh, David Ogilvy, another guy that's fantastic for getting people to do stuff with writing. Thank you for the uh, recommendation, Jack. Yeah, for sure, they're fabulous. I should read them again. But uh, okay, Jeremy, any other thing to do more or less of? Nah, I think, uh, I think that's enough for this week. There you go. More cold emailing and great cast here. Great cast, Jack. Before we go, let's do a quick recap so it's clear what you should and should not do. You want to do less of these things. Manual email finding, personalization of offline prospects, list prepping, subject line testing, email designing, and finally worrying about building your entire sequence in the beginning. Now, what to do more of? Focusing on building a hot list, or like Jeremy said, matching your audience to your offer, deliverability testing, value prop testing, improving each week so that you don't just fire and forget, and finally, rewriting your CTAs so that they're clear and to the point. Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. I'll teach you. I'll tune in. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks.